Um, hey guys, how's it going? Um, hope you all have been having a good day and a good week. Sorry for the slightly delayed presentation today. Um, unfortunately, um, Kavindu, who is uh, meant to deliver the presentation, uh, is not is not here due to unforeseen circumstances. So I'm just going to be delivering uh, the presentation on his behalf. Um, so we're going to start off with, um, yep, that's him. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to message him. Uh, he'll be more than happy to help you with any questions you may have. Um, so we're going to start with a bit of uh, microbiology. Um, and this stuff's um, quite moderate yield because on the exam, you'd often see questions. Uh, however, most of these questions would be based on um, stuff you'd already done and uh, a lot of buzzwords. So as long as you know that, you should be fine for exam purposes. Um, so starting off with host-parasite relationships. Um, so between the parasite and host, you might have three different types of relationships based on how beneficial that relationship is for each one of them. Uh, mutualism, as the term suggests, is when two organisms live together and they benefit from the um, interaction. Uh, commensalism is one where you have one benefiting, but the other uh, neither really has anything to gain or anything to lose. And then parasitism is when one benefits at the total expense of the other, much like first and second years. Um, OK, so the human normal flora. So as you might know, the human body has tons and tons of microbes within it on its surface. Um, and this is what's called the normal flora. Now, it's important to remember that this flora is not pathogenic and does not cause issues in normal circumstances. Um, you would have cases where your normal flora might actually cause an infection. And that would be in, in certain cases where you have a break in the external barriers or if you're immunosuppressed in the case of um, things like HIV or if you're on special immunosuppressant medications. Um, and we'll cover that later a bit in the immunology section. Um, so if you basically categorize different types of flora, in the skin, you mostly have gram-positive uh, bacteria. Uh, your GIT would be mostly um, bacteria which would be tolerant to high levels of acid which makes sense for it to survive it would have to survive the, the acidic environment of the stomach and the GIT. Um, it is very important to remember that the upper respiratory tract has both gram positive and gram negative bacteria within it however the lower respiratory tract is sterile which means that if you find um, a bacteria in the lower respiratory tract it's, it's most often uh, an indication of an underlying infection. Um, so that's something to be um, mindful of. Um, and also the um, upper urinary tract, it is also usually sterile. However, you might have infections, and those would be your UTIs, which we'll discuss a bit later. So going down to the real basic stuff, prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. I'm sure this has been discussed more than it should be already. Uh, but just going over that again, so prokaryotic organisms are your mostly your bacteria. So they're unicellular. They do not have any membrane-bound organelles. Um, a common question which often comes up in exams and has in the past as well would be which of the following features um, does not correlate or support that the organism is a prokaryotic one. And they'll throw in something like a mitochondria or a Golgi body. And that should just straight away let you know that this is not prokaryotic organism because they do not have any membrane bound organelles. Um, they have complex cell walls as compared to eukaryotic uh, cells, which are usually more simpler. Um, and then they also have a, a much greater tolerance to um, a, different types of environments. This can be really acidic or even in terms of um, very high and very low temperature. But that's not really important for exam purposes. Um, gram positive versus gram negative. OK, so this is something which comes up quite often. And it's something you might have gone done a bit of in histology as well. I know in histology, most of things look like either blue or pink blobs on other blue or pink blobs. Um, but for the purposes of this exam, gram positive and gram negative bacteria um, basically have to do with what's known as gram staining, which is a stain we use to identify whether an organism is gram positive or gram negative. And in the hospital setting, that's often used um, in things like um, empirical treatment and um, kind of making sure that you're giving the person the right antibiotics. So gram positive bacteria has a thick peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, and it's this peptidoglycan cell wall which helps it take up the dye, and that's why it's purple in a gram positive stain, in a, in a gram stain. And the negative um, bacteria have a, has a thin pep peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, it's also a double membrane, um, and then the gram stain is pink. 
Um, binary fission, a uh, really simple process by which uh, most prokaryotic and bacteria divide. Um, it first involves the uh, duplication of the pro prokaryotic chromosomes and the genetic material, followed by division of the entire cell into two daughter cells. Um, Okay, so your so your bacteria have what's known are uh, what's known as virulence factors, and these are basically certain specific features on your bacteria which help it uh, cause an infection or to invade a host. Um, these include things like adhesion molecules, which um, firstly prevent the physical removal of the host. So this helps bacteria to stick to your cell walls and cell linings. Um, certain bacteria also have antiphagocytic features. Um, and what this basically does is we'll discuss this a bit in the in the immunology section. But um, ideally, when your body detects um, a bacteria, it uses what's known as a lysosome, which is um, kind of a little sag of really, really um, toxic enzymes and uh, reactive factors. Um, and uh, certain bacteria have uh, special features which firstly prevent the action of these enzymes and also prevent the phagocytic action of most of your immune cells. Um, disease process, um, I'm sure this has been mentioned a lot of times, diseases are not normal. So if you have a disease, it makes sense that one of these uh, features would have taken place and there would have been um, some breach of your um, natural immune barriers. Um, viruses. So viruses, obviously, as you know, are hugely important in the medical field. Uh, these are, they, I mean, they, they are considered to be non-living organisms because they uh, exist only, only exclusively within other living organisms. Uh, there's a lot of debate whether viruses are living or not, but that's not important for this. Um, you can classify your viruses into two very broad categories based on the type of genetic material they have. So this can be RNA versus DNA. Um, makes sense that RNA would have RNA as its primary genetic material, while DNA would have DNA. Um, your DNA viruses include things like your varicella zoster, um, you have your um, herpes virus, um, adenovirus, your uh, cytomegalovirus, those are all your DNA viruses. Um, your important RNA viruses would include things like influenza, HIV, parainfluenza, and so on. Um, Knowing these um, are important to a certain extent. Um, later in the presentation, there is a table of important uh, viruses and their DNA and RNA. So I just recommend having a look through that um, because you might get a question for that. Um, so retrovirus, ret retroviruses again are a subset of viruses, and then your HIV is a type of retrovirus. Um, and then you can further classify them as uh, based on the kind of organisms they attack and what their range of action is. Um, okay, so now what is your viral disease progression? So obviously you first have the entry of a virus within the cell or uh, within the body. Um, the, the usual way viruses function is they have an initial, re initial response and then they have um, kind of a flare up later on in life. Um, and that's common with things like chickenpox. Um, you can have an initial infection with chickenpox, um, which then is uh, not active for a long while. It goes dormant. However, in later years, certain factors can trigger it to um, kind of re-express itself and cause things like shingles. Um, so the process would basically include your primary infection. Um, you would have an innate immune response irrespective of the virus because that's what your body is meant to do. We'll talk a bit about innate versus adaptive immunity uh, in the immunology session, um, but that's really important for this part. Um, most viruses have an incubation period. So your incubation period is basically the time between when you got infected versus when you first saw the kind of presence of pathological factors or features, which would be indicative of a disease. So for things like flu and uh, the common cold, the incubation period is quite short, um, around 12 hours to two days. However, for things like HIV, it's much longer. So you might actually be infected, I hope none of you are, with HIV, but you may only experience kind of a, patholo a pathological effect much later on in life. Um, and then eventually it can go to target tissues based on the virus and um, have specific uh, reactions with certain parts of your body. 
Um, so within the cell, uh, most of your viruses, as you know, have to replicate purely within your cell. They do this through uh, two factors. It's called H and N, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Um, and that's very important for things like your influenza or your flu. And um, a lot of these viruses are actually based on differences in the um, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase receptors. Um, and that's what basically determines the strain of the flu. So when they say that there are seasonal changes, um, and that's the reason why you need a new flu shot every year, because these receptors undergo some slight changes, uh, which make previous flu shots inefficient. Um, so firstly, you'd have your attachment via a receptor. This would usually be your hem hemagglutinin receptor. Um, entry into the cell. Um, replication. Replication is really important because uh, this is the way it, in which it kind of produces more of its own kind. Um, and it does so using the cellular mechanisms of the host cell. This is really important because viruses themselves cannot replicate in isolation. And that's why they need the host cell factors and enzymes to actually reproduce. After they have done, after they've done replicating and have, and have produced all the genetic um, material and the cell material, they need to reassemble and then they're eventually released. And uh, this is catalyzed by the neuroaminidase receptor. Um, fungi, uh, again, they're eukaryotic obligate aerobes, which means that they are eukaryotic cells which can survive only in aerobic conditions. Um, so these, these won't be found in things like the gut, where you often have anaerobic conditions. Um, cell wall is made of chitin. Uh, this is important because it often comes up in exams. Um, you have different types. Here you have your yeast, your molds, and also your dimorphic fungi. Uh, your yeast and molds are fairly easy to understand. Your dimorphic fungi usually involve certain specific types of algae, which um, have a yeast and a mold phase, depending on the environment. So whether that's in the external environment or within your own body, they can express themselves in two different, in two different forms. Um, fungal diseases. So fungal diseases aren't really common in a clinical setting. Um, the most common condition, fungal diseases you'd see would be either an allergic response to some of them or a more severe kind of response in the case of fungal toxicosis, in which you'd see the release of certain toxic factors um, which would then have uh, negative effects like respiratory depression, headaches, and so on. Um, and the severity, as would make sense, depends on the time, the amount of exposure, um, as well as uh, the circumstances during the exposure. Uh, the transmission of infection. So you have various routes of infection, and certain bacteria and um, pathological strains can only be transmitted in one way or the other. So as you know, your... Um, Things like gastro would obviously be through the fecal oral route. Um, however, things like influenza, the common cold, um, those are through aerosols and um, respiratory to respirate to respiratory factors. Um, however, you might have venere, uh, venereal spreads and things like um, HIV, hepatitis, um, and also bloodborne arth arthropods are your insects so you, things like malaria dengue chikungunya would be through arthropods um your vec your vertebrate vertebrates are the uh things like rabies so if you get bitten by a dog you need to have certain injections done and that's against rabies and then you might have um oops yep and then you might have other causes like rats or other infestations causing things like the bubonic plague which are not good um, your community acquired infections. So these are infections you would mostly see in a community setting. So if you talk about infections, you can think of them as community community acquired and hospital acquired. So there are certain um, infections which you're more likely to gain in a hospital setting. Uh, these have to do with um, obviously the fact that people in hospital would be in a more debilitative state and they might have more severe infections, infections which you would not usually see within the community. Um, now, this is something which is briefly mentioned, I think, in your theme one and theme two as well uh, for health promotion and the different types of infections. You might have an epidemic, um, which is a level of disease above the usual for the population. Um, it's usually characterized by a very rapid rise in incidence. So things like your flu, um, they usually have a seasonal nature. Um, and a flu would be considered an epidemic if you have a very sudden increase in the incidence of the flu, 
um, which is way above what you'd usually expect for that population. Um, endemic, uh, these disease, like these kind of infections are uh, kind of usually always present. They don't have a seasonal pattern. You would really expect um, huge fluctuations in this. So things like cholera, your malaria, your gastro, basically, you do not see seasonal changes. Um, if you do travel elsewhere, uh, then the travel is usually important. But endemic diseases are basically diseases which are localized to an area and are expected. Your outbreaks, um, so things like Ebola, if you have uh, a huge occurrence of a disease within a very specific population, so that's called an outbreak. Um, the, the difference between an outbreak and an epidemic is that you would expect there to be some level of disease in an epidemic, and an epidemic would be the rise. Yeah, while things like Ebola, you would not expect there to be Ebola going around in the community. Um, and if there is, it is an, an it is an outbreak. And then your pandemics like a global epidemic. So if you have an epidemic on the, uh, an epidemic outbreak on the, on the global scale, that's your pandemic. Um, and then again, so of acquired so of infection might be community acquired. Zootonic is from animals, arthropods, insects. Uh, nosocomial infections are important because these are the ones you'd expect in a hospital setting. Um, you'd see these in. Uh, things like people who have urinary catheters put in or who are on um, kind of ventilation. Um, and this would just make them more likely to urinary tract infections and respiratory infections, um, respectively. And then your iatrogenic uh, infections are the ones following what what we, what like what like a normal procedure would be. So this might be a surgical procedure. And then if you develop an infection after that, um, it's iatrogenic. Um, this is a, a quite, uh, this is basically a list of the most important kind of organisms you'd need to know. The ones highlighted are more important than others. Um, so your compilobacter jejuni is what causes your basic gastro. Your, I'll, be, I'll just mention a few specific features about each one of them, um, which often come up in exams as buzzwords, so you should just know that. Um, your mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, often, uh, so a common fact about this is, um, about 1 billion people are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. However, in most cases, it does not actually lead to disease. Um, in the cases which it does, it has, a, it has a primary infection and a secondary one, and it's really good at staying latent and undetected in your body. Staph aureus, I'm sure this would, be, this would have been mentioned a lot. If not, it would be definitely in second semester. Your Staph aureus is a normal pathogen which is on your skin. Um, however, if there are breaks in the skin tissue and things like cuts, bruises, surgeries, um, or certain operations, you might have a staph aureus infection. And these are really, really uh, severe. And if you do, you'd need immediate intervention and IV antibiotics. Um, a, a very common buzzword for staph aureus is someone comes in who's an IV drug user. Um, and it's more, li more likely than not, it's going to be staph aureus. Your E. coli is your normal gut flora, and it often causes um, gastro. Um, your Helicobacter pylori, uh, it's important for peptic ulcers. So uh, peptic ulcers, as, re as was discovered by two Australian scientists, very partial, and they won the Nobel Prize for this, that most um, peptic ulcers are caused by a Helicobacter pylori infection. Um, strep pyogenes is what your uh, strep throat is. So if, you ever had, if you've ever had strep throat, which is uh, your pharyngitis or tonsillitis, that's your strep pyogenes. And then Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it's really important in upper respiratory tract infections. A common buzzword for this is cystic fibrosis. So if someone has cystic fibrosis, uh, they're really prone to um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. Um, and just these are a few more classifications based on whether you carry out or uh, yeah, whether they're some, yeah, sorry, there's some eukaryotic organisms and the disease they cause. Um, the important ones which often come up are malaria, um, filariasis, which basically is uh, the blocking of your lymph nodes. And this causes, uh, this may cause elephantiasis, which is the severe swelling of one of your extremities. Um, yeah, and just going on, these are a few fungi, um, which may cause oral and genital infections. Um, and you'd not see them in usual circumstances.
Um, again, you have your DNA viruses and the disease they cause. Um, as mentioned, Epstein-Barr is your glandular fever. So if you've had glandular fever uh, after MedCamp, it's probably Epstein-Barr. Um, your papilloma virus, um, it does cause a, a higher risk for you having, for, for a woman having um, cervical cancer if she's had a, a papilloma virus infection, and thus that's why we do pap smears. Your herpes simplex is of two types. It might be herpes simplex 1, which is your oral, and herpes simplex 2, which is your genital. And then you have your hep hepatitis virus, which is um, hep B. You have different other strains, but hep B is the really important one, and it causes acute inflammation of the liver or hepatitis. Your RNA viruses are the ones mostly seen in things like the flu, um, measles, and so on. Um, sterilization methods. So... Uh, these are the few ways in which you can sterilize stuff. Uh, the most effect, the most effective one is more more sterilization with pressure. Um, it basically kills everything, and it's much more efficient and takes less time. For dry heat, um, I believe you can do it at 170 degrees for one hour or 160 degrees for I think one and a half or two hours. So those usually take a bit of time, and also it's important to consider that you can't do heat therapy in heat sensitive uh, so items so whether that's your gloves or um, certain plastics you would not expose them to those temperatures so you have other kind of interventions like ionization radiations for heat sensitive materials and some foods um, filtrations if it's liquid uh, you could filter them um, and that's the same with gases as well um, these are your agar bases this would have been briefly mentioned in your histology in one of your histology perhaps i believe um the three main ones are your so the four main ones are your um mcconkey agar which contains lactose and um it's basically used to detect certain uh, bacteria which um are able to um metabolize lactose into lactic acid um so the use and uh, changes in the in the plate of are indicative of um, that bacteria. You may have your mannitol salt agars, um, and that's used for staph aureus usually. Um, another important one is your horse blood agar. Um, so you learn this in second year a bit, uh, but your, your certain bacteria are maybe alpha hemolytic or beta hemolytic. And what these basically mean is that um, they can actually hemolyze your blood cell or basically lyse them or kill them. And in a clinical setting, this would obviously be quite important and dangerous. So these are used to diagnose and detect those kind of um, bacteria. Um, nosocomial infections, as I mentioned before, are your infections within a hospital setting. The most common one would be your urinary tract infections, and those would be because of things like catheters. Um, but you also have um, other things like pneumonia and uh, surgical wounds. Okay, so that's most of what you would have for microbiology. Uh, I wouldn't stress too much about that. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go and learn all the specific bacteria because I don't think it's important. Uh, what is important is uh, going through the ones which you definitely cover in your active learning um, sessions as well as your um, post quizzes um, because those would be pretty high yield. And if it has been mentioned in active learning, um, I'd recommend just going through them uh, just so if it comes up on an exam, you aren't completely um, kind of surprised or taken aback by that. Um, so moving on to immunology. Um, so starting really simple, um, you can divide your immune system into two basic and broad categories. You have your innate immunity and your adaptive immunity. So your innate immunity is the immunity which is present um, throughout your body, and that is um, that, that that's used to deal with acute phase infections. So if you have a, if your body is ever exposed to an external pathogen in an area where it should not be, that's where your innate immunity kicks in. It includes things like your epithelial barriers, your macrophages, your neutrophils, and your complements. And these trigger um, kind of an acute phase uh, inflammatory response, which are important and will be discussed later. But then your adaptive immunity is your very specific immunity, which kicks in at, uh, later. Uh, there is an interaction between your innate and adaptive, and you have things like uh, certain types of cells called antigen-presenting cells. Um, we'll discuss this a bit later. They include things like your macrophages, natural killer cells, and your dendritic cells. And what they basically do is after killing certain um, pathogens, 
um, during the acute phase of the infection, they break the pathogen down and present certain molecules belonging to that specific pathogen to your adaptive immunity cells, so your B lymphocytes and your T lymphocytes. And what this eventually results in is a more specific immune response, which are targeted to those specific pathogens only. So you would not see your adaptive immunity uh, being really active uh, without due cause. Um, also, yep, your adaptive immunity has memory, so things like vaccinations and um, things like if you get a certain disease once, you're, you're not likely to get it again. Those are based on the fact that you have certain memory cells, um, in which case if you do get an infection again, those would kick in much faster than they would in, during initial exposure and kind of neutralize that much quickly. Okay, your cells of the immune system, you might have your myeloid cells, your lymphoid cells, and these are basically based on this kind of um, the embryological and developmental um, origin of them. So you have your pluripotent hemopoietic stem cells, and um, this basically gives rise to everything within all, all the cells within your blood, basically. So you might have uh, firstly dividing into a, a lymphoid progenitor, um, and that results in your B cells, your T cells, and your NK cells. Um, but then you might have a common myeloid pro progenitor, which um, helps produce more of those innate immunity cells, so your neutrophils, your eosinophils, um, macrophages, and so on. Um, you also end up producing your uh, platelets and, and erythrocytes or red blood cells from these myeloid progenitors, uh, but these don't really have uh, a role in infection. Um, platelets would be briefly covered, but those would be for things like injury and not necessarily an infection. So your de development of your lymphocytes, as you mentioned, you broadly have your B lymphocytes and your T lymphocytes. And the really easy way to remember this is your B lymphocytes matures in the bone, so B for B, and your T lymphocytes matures in the thymus, which is a gland near the heart. So T for T, B for B. It's a really easy way to remember it. Um, and once these mature, they circulate in the blood or lymph until they reach your peripheral lymphoid tissue. And what your peripheral lymphoid tissue usually is, if you've done lymphatics slightly, um, I think you would have, yep. Um, so things like your lymph nodes, your spleen, and other parts of the lymphatic system where the lymph actually drains into. Um, we'll discuss the reason for that a bit later. But first, um, a bit about the development of your B and T cells. Um, so as you mentioned that these cells are meant to only be active against your normal your uh, pathogens yep so you would not expect your b and t cells to be active against your own um own body cells and if you think about it they there has to be something which causes that distinction to take place um so during its uh embryological development um you have certain um receptors uh so the B and T cells need to express certain receptors, however, not be too active at the same time. So if you have something like a, a complete failure to express the pre-antigen receptor, the cell dies because it means it, it won't be able to kind of um, be activated in the case of an infection. However, if it has a very strong antigen recognition, we don't want that either. So we try to eliminate the both the ends of the extreme spectrum and go for that mid-level weak antigen recognition. Um, it might seem slightly counterintuitive uh, because um, you would think that with any cell you'd want a strong recognition. However, if you think about it, it makes sense because you wouldn't want to have uh, uh, an elevated uh, immune response under normal circumstances. Um, yep, and just going a bit more into that so your with your t-cells you broadly have your two types of t-cells you have your cd4 plus helper cells and your cd8 plus cytotoxic cells um now usually these would be immature and what monash likes to call naive t-cells and b-cells um and um these are only activated after they are presented with an antigen remember when we talked about the antigen presenting cells and your macrophages and your NK cells and your dendritic cells, which actually present the antigen onto the um, uh, lymphoid cells. So basically, these are only activated once that presentation has taken place. Um, now, 
you would have heard of this term called the MHC, which is the major histocompatibility complex. And that is basically what helps present that uh, pathogenic or antigen um, specific proteins on its surface. Um, you might have two types of MHCs, which we'll discuss a bit further. Um, these are your MHC class one and your MHC class two. Um, now, the major distinction between these two is that your MHC class one receptors are present on all the cells of your body. So irrespective of whether that's your blood cells, your um, alveolar tissue, or your lymphoid, or your immunity cells, all of them would present class one. However, class two MHC receptors are only found on antigen presenting cells. And we'll discuss this a bit further. About, yeah, okay. I'll probably mention this here. Um, so with your T cells, you basically have two types of cells, as I mentioned. So you have your CD4 plus cells, and then you have your CD8 plus cells. Your CD4 plus cells are what are called as helper cells, and these help activate the B lymphocytes. However, your CD8 plus cells, they identify the presence of a pathogen through these MHC receptors, and these are called cytotoxic. So if a cell is expressing um, a certain pathogen through the MHC class one receptor that is picked up by the CD8 cells. And because it identifies that cell as infected, it releases certain enzymes and um, chemical factors, which basically lies the cell. So your CD8 plus cells are your um, cytotoxic cells. And coming back to the presence of MHC class one versus class two, it makes sense because any cell of your body might be infected. So if you want to have a cytotoxic action, you would have to have your MHC class one receptor present for it to be able to present uh, the antigen to the CD8 plus cells. A good tool to remember this is uh, the rule of eight. So um, your CD8 would recognize class one. So good way to remember it is eight times one is eight. And then your CD4 would recognize class two. So four times two is also eight. So that's just a way you can remember it. Okay, so your macrophages. Um, I'm sure Richard in one of the active learnings talked about how if you prick your finger with a twig or some other thing, you might have a response. Um, and uh, these are mostly um, mediated by certain innate immunity factors. One of the major ones are your macrophages. So when they're in tissue, they're called, oops, yeah, when they're in tissue, they're called macrophages. However, when they're in the bloodstream, they're called monocytes. They're usually free to wander around cells and, um, however, if you see an aggregation, it's usually a sign of infection. So a question which commonly comes up in exams is um, the presence of macrophages in tissues. Is it or is it not an indication of infection? Uh, the simple answer would be no, it is not an indication because you'd expect there to be macrophages present normally. And those are kind of your security guards for your tissues, which uh, deal with the big bully if it comes in. However, um, you would expect them to have them none you would expect them to be present nonetheless. Um, so if you do have an ex external exposure, um, these would be detected by your macrophages. So your macrophages would take up these cells, phagocy phagocytose, any pathogenic factors. And in return, they would uh, produce certain cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. Um, I know you, you the lecturers love to talk at extreme lengths about the various types of interleukin-1, but for the for the purposes of year one, all you need to know is that these are certain factors which further help um, kind of call more immune, immune cells in, as well as uh, trigger uh, acute phase inflammation. Yep, so neutrophils. So neutrophils are the most abundant WBC in the cell. This is a very common question asked in exams. What's your most common uh, white blood cell, it's, it's your neutrophils. You would not expect to see neutrophils commonly found in tissue. However, in the case of an infection, as I said before, your macrophages, which are in the tissue, would um, release certain cytokines and chemokines. Uh, a good way to think about it is that your chemokines um, are often related to uh, kind of mediating the presence of other immune cells. So your chemokines would uh, basically ask your neutrophils to infiltrate that particular tissue, and then your cytokines would cause acute phase inflammation. 
Um, you also have your dendritic cells, and your dendritic cells are really important for um, kind of ensuring that your cells aren't too infected. So if you do see a dendritic cell, uh, they would be in close association with your normal cells. Um, and what these often do is, in the case of an infection, you would see uh, them lysing the cell as well as taking up some of that uh, pathogenic uh, proteins and factors and presenting it on its surface and thus acting as an antigen-presenting cell. Now, coming back to what I said before, antigen-presenting cells would go on and activate your uh, naive T cells. Um, and this would mostly be in lymphoid tissue uh, where most of these T cells would be present. Um, I know lymphatics isn't something which a lot of people in all honesty care about, uh, but it's quite important if you think about think about from an immune perspective. So it's really going through, um, you have tons of lymph nodes, and these are basically certain sites where lymph eventually drains into, and these are very important for the purposes of antigen presentation. You also have your bone marrow, which as you mentioned, B for B lymphocytes, and your thymus, uh, T for T cells. Um, and your spleen also helps detect bloodborne antigens, much like the rest of your lymph nodes. Um, I'm not really going to cover tons of detail about how this takes place. Uh, it's not really high yield. But just know that all lymph uh, basically drains into lymph nodes at some point of time. And this is where your B and T cells would reside in. So any infiltrate, any antigen presenting cells would go to the lymph nodes and then present the cell to the uh, lymphocytes. Um, now, journey of a T cell. So, after being um, okay, so once you have an effector, so basically something which is causing the T cell to be activated, it would go on to the lymph nodes and then activate your B cells. Does that make sense? So, you have your CD4 cells, which are your T helper cells, and they help activate your B cells. And your B lymphocytes are really important because they help produce antibodies. Um, we're going to talk about the different types of antibodies shortly. But what these antibodies do is that they basically help uh, provide that really specific immune response. Um, and that's where things like um, your vaccinations and your natural immunity come in. Um, so we've already discussed this uh, here and there throughout this lecture. Uh, you also have something which is really important. It's called the complement system. Um, it would have been mentioned really briefly in terms of there being C3 and C4 um, complementary cells. And um, these are present in huge numbers. So you'd expect there to be 1.2 uh, milligrams of uh, complements per ml. Uh, if you think about it, this doesn't seem much. But if on a normal scale, that is about 10 to the 15th power per ml. So you don't, so you, 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 you could kind of make, or have an idea of the number of complements you'd have throughout your body. Um, and they basically help uh, neutralize pathogens th through different ways. So you have your activation of your complement. So if you have something like your C3, uh, it will result in the cleaving of it into C3A and C3B. And then each one of these has a different function. So C, C, the, the A's, so your C3A, C5A, they recruit phagocytic cells to help phagocytose them. And then your um, C3B basically attached to those um, pathogens. And what they do is they basically mark it for eventual de degeneration. So your immune cells going around would basically go and kill any cell which has a C3B um, presented on its surface. Why is it useful? Uh, so as I mentioned, um, it helps in opsonization, which is basically uh, marking certain cells for eventual lysis. Um, chemotaxis, I mentioned with there being uh, the attraction of macrophages, neutrophils, and other cytokines. Um, and it also plays a role with lysing certain cells through um, inflammasomes and other molecular pathways. Uh, so briefly, we mentioned about we mentioned the innate immune system, your neutrophils and your macrophages, and them recognizing um, these pathogens. But we didn't really mention how they do so. Um, so they do so through these certain factors and patterns present on pathogenic cells, and these are called PAPs. So these are your pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So the important thing to remember about your PAMPs is that 
these are certain features found only on phagocytic cells and they would not be found on any of your normal um, human cells. This is basic, this basically involves things like um, lipopolysaccharides on your gram negative bacteria, flagella, double stranded RNA, um, unme unmethylated CP CPG nucleotides. Um, and these are all things you would not expect to find in your normal cells, your normal eukaryotic human cells. Um, and the presence of these would indicate that there is a pathogen. Um, so your pathogen associated molecular patterns are recognized by, yeah, you guessed it, your pathogen recognizing receptors. So it's pretty straightforward. The, your pathogen recognizing receptors are found on your innate immune cells, your macrophages, your neutrophils, your dendritic cells, and they detect these PAMPs. So you might have what are known as toll-like receptors. <coughs> so these are receptors which basically are found on the surface, on the extracellular surface, as well as the uh, endosomal membrane. So they're found on the surface of the uh, innate immune cells. However, they're also found within the innate immune cells. So on the surface, they help recognize the bacteria through some of these factors. And endosomal membrane toll-like receptors recognize viruses through things like double stranded RNA or the specific proteins within the viral capsule. Um, Toll-like receptors, as we already mentioned, uh, they would detect the PAMPs, um, things like bacterial lipopolysaccharides, um, and this would basically cause uh, the activation of these macrophages and innate immune cells. Um, they've detected the pathogen and now they have to break it down. So you'd have um, phagocytosis and also acute inflammation which would then help bring in all those other immune cells um, and just get rid of the pathogen in the first place. Um, this is something which I distinctly remember from the active, from our active learning last year with Richard. Um, he really focused a lot about this and I, this is very high yield for exam purposes. So he talked about the various stages of um, kind of a, an external injury or a wound. And uh, firstly, you'd have a penetrating injury, you'd have various pathogens released on the within the tissue. Um, as we mentioned, your macrophages um, are within the tissue and can detect this. So these would be detected by your macrophages through the PAMPs, as you mentioned, so your pathogen-associated molecular patterns through like your uh, toe-like receptors and your pattern-recognizing receptors. This would in turn result in the phagocytosis of these, as shown here, as well as the release of certain factors um, your cytokines and your chemokines by your macrophage. Now, cytokines and your chemokines eventually go and bind to the endothelial surface. Your endothelium is basically the, the membrane of your capillaries and your other blood cells. This would result in certain um, physiological changes to the surface, uh, dilation, and uh, which would facilitate the entry of your neutrophils and your acute uh, acute infection phase proteins. Uh, he talked a lot, a little about your five cardinal signs of infection, your calor, which is heat. So if you are infected, you'd assume an area to be hot, um, rubor, redness, dolar pain, tumor swelling, and uh, functulasia, which is your loss of function. So even if you think about this in terms of things you probably would have seen happen to yourself if you've ever had an injury, which I'm sure you have, you would have all of these. So your calor is because of increased blood flow to this area. So vasodilation of your capillaries would result in more blood flow, causing the area to be warm. Your rubor redness is because of the acute inflammation. Pain is because of pain, it's fairly simple. Your tumor swelling, it would be because of the um, kind of the draining of uh, fluids and your neutrophils into uh, that particular tissue and it'll cause things like pus buildup. Um, another common question which comes up on the exam is if you see pus draining from a wound, um, what is it usually composed of? And the answer would be that it's usually composed of neutrophils, which infiltrated from the cell um, in response to that acute inflammation. Um, again, your inflammasomes are your certain uh, factors present on um, your innate immune cells, and they basically help uh, lyse certain cells if they do express certain proteins. It, in that very simple explanation of what basically happens. You have a lot of cascades, and I would not recommend uh, doing this particularly. Uh, however, what I think is important is the fact that you have uh, the breakdown of 
proteins from the pathogen, um, which then has a role in acute inflammation. So you have certain uh, genes which prescribe these inflammatory factors. Uh, these are pro-factors, which means they aren't active usually. And it's only when there is an infection are these activated and then they produce um, inflammatory factors which eventually cause inflammation. Again, your inflammation of your macrophages, uh, already mentioned your PAMPs, via your toll-like receptors, and they cause the release of cytokines as well as other uh, the infiltration of other um, adaptive and innate immune factors. Uh, your natural killer cells. Um, so these are your lymphocytes. Uh, now this is one of the common, one of the only exceptions you'd see where a lymphocyte is part of your innate immune system. So your lymphocyte, which is basically your B cells and your T cells, are all part of the adaptive immune system. However, your NK cells are part of the innate immune system. So what this basically does is it helps recognize infected and stressed cells and that ends up killing them. So what the question comes up, how can it recognize whether the cell is distressed or whether there is uh, an infection? And the very simple explanation of what of, of this process would be that your natural killer cells are bound to your normal cells uh, through ligands and other channels. And there is always a, a cross dialogue between these two. So you'd expect the normal cell to send signals regularly to your NK cells. And these are individual signals saying, oh, I'm still fine. I'm still alive. Don't kill me, much like how a lot of us med students feel. Um, and this, the presence of the signal basically indicates that everything's fine. However, if a cell is infected, a cell is stressed out, or is not able to function properly, it won't, it won't, it will no longer be able to uh, release these signals and indicate that it is so-called fine, which is again how most of us feel during spot vac. And that would basically let the natural killer cell know that, oh no, the cell is not fine because it stopped talking to me. And it'll basically release certain um, reactive factors, your reactive oxygen species, and other ke um, chemical kind of mediators, which would eventually lyse the cell. Um, interferons, these are basically more involved in your antiviral state. So if a natural killer cell ends up killing the cell which was infected by a virus, it would in turn secrete certain interferons which would um, then further act on other cells and kind of elevate the immune response. Your adaptive immune system, so just going over this quickly. So we mentioned that there are antigen presenting cells, your APCs, which present the antigen to your adaptive immune systems. These are your dendritic cells, your macrophages. Um, and then you have your antibodies, which are released by your B cells. So these are often immunoglobulins, so your Igs. You have different types, IgG, IgM, AE, and these are present in different locations, which we'll just talk about. So detection of self versus non-self antigens. Uh, great meme there, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, so with your B cells, your B cells would secrete antibodies. Your T cells would um, basically help detect and mark certain cells. So you'd often have naive T help cells, which would get which would get activated by your antigen presenting cells. These would further go on to activate your B cells. And then, as we mentioned earlier, you have your cytotoxic T cells, which would uh, detect the presence of um, certain pathological proteins through MHC class 1. Don't forget that. So your CD8 is MHC class 1 and your CD4 is your MHC class 2. Okay, so now what is the basic response? Okay, so you had an antigen presenting cell come in, it activated your CD4, your CD8, your CD4 then went on to activate your B cells. So what happens is you have your um, B cells and your antibodies which are released as a result of that activation. Um, the way this goes is that um, antibodies are very, very specific. So you would have, you would need the B cells to be activated by and provided information on the very specific nature of the pathogen and the pathogenic proteins which can be acted upon by those antibodies. You don't have general antibodies for all conditions. You have very specific antibodies for specific proteins on certain pathogens. So even if there's changes in the protein structure of the envelope, as is seen in the case of the flu, with it changing every year, your antibodies would no longer be active. So your phase of your adaptive immunity, um, this usually kicks in a day or two after initial infection as compared to your innate, which is very immediate. 
um, you see differentiation and um, eventual cell-mediated immunity. Uh, and then most of your factors, your CD4, your CD8, often tend to apoptose, which means they're no longer required. However, you still have some memory cells or your B cells, which would remember this uh, and basically help produce antibodies much quicker if there's a recurrent infection. So if there is a recurrent infection, you will no longer have to go through this entire cascade again and secrete antibodies roughly around day five, which is where it usually goes. You just start off really quickly and neutralize the pathogen before it actually causes anything. Um, yeah, uh, a common question which, uh, it's not really important, but it really helps with your understanding. Um, he, it, professors like to talk about how uh, it, your body has like huge variations in the number of B cells and they're really specific. And they talk about T cell receptors and B cell receptors and how they have a variable region and a constant region and how the variable region is different for each one. What this basically means is that the variable region, again, if you don't understand, it's not really high yield, but it's good to know. So your, your variable region has huge variations in terms of um, what you can potentially identify, right? So we talked about how your antigen presenting cell would come up and try to find the right adaptive immunity cell. And the reason behind that is, it, 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 in order for it to be detected, it would need the very specific um, B cell receptor for that particular antigen. Now, in simple terms, the reason that that happens is because the variation is so enormous that you would tend to find a certain random assortment of B cells which would express that particular factor you're looking for. So there isn't any ingrained kind of identifiable encyclopedia which has a huge list of potential antigens it's literally that the variation and random assortment is so huge that irrespective of whatever the pathogen is and what the path what the antigen is presenting or sorry with the antigen which is being presented you would expect to have at least a few b cells which would have that particular detection feature and once that and once those are activated they would proliferate really quickly multiply it to have like a systemic effect um yeah but that's something i personally found to be really confusing and um we have here so your antibodies are secreted from the surface of the b cells you have your light chain and your heavy chain and this is the region i was talking about so this is your variable region and this region is the one which actually goes on and attaches itself to pathogens the constant region is your fc which is initially embedded in the b cells um surface um, and you'd expect them to kind of pluriflate and get released from B cells during an infection. Um, so again, each chain has constant and variable region. We've already discussed that. Okay, so now the different types of antibodies. So as we mentioned before, you have different types of antibodies, um, and it is important to know where these antibodies are and certain antibodies and what their role is. Um, your IgA is what's associated with mucosal immunity. So when you have the mucous membranes and your mucous sites, uh, so things like your upper airways, if there is an infection there, you would expect your IgA to kick in. Your IgD, it's not really, uh, it doesn't really have an anti antibiotic role, so to speak. It basically is your B cell receptor, which never really leaves the B cell. So it stays on the B cells. Um, your IgE are your are the ones which activate mast cells and they produce allergic responses. So a common question that comes up is um, asthma is often involved in, uh, asthma, sorry, commonly involves which of the following um, immunoglobulins and the answer is IgE, which is active, which activates mast cells. Um, it's also really important in um, kind of defense against helminths, which are these worms and parasites, uh, which these other antibodies are too small or too inefficient to actually target. Um, your IgEs also help recruit eosinophils, which are these other cells which are mostly effective against helminths of these really large pathogens. Um, your IgE, I, sorry, your IgG is commonly um, involved in neonatal immunity. So when we talk about um, uh, the certain immunity being acquired from the mother, that's your IgG. 
Um, and then your IgM is the first, is the one which is first at the scene and opsonizes or basically marks certain cells for degeneration. Um, effective function of antibodies. So as we mentioned, they can either neutralize or um, ops, uh, they can help with opsonization and also activate complement pathways. So neutralization, um, they bind to viral particles and prevent interaction with host cells. So they, they are effectively neutralized. Um, if they can't do that, they basically coat the pathogen and your other cells then detect this uh, Ig uh, and say, that, okay, this pathogen is coated with this. We need to destroy this. And that's how that takes place. Or you have your complement activation through your C3 and your C4 complement pathways, uh, which we discussed earlier. And then your hypersensitivity. So hypersensitivity is when you have kind of an increased immune response when you wouldn't really want one. Um, so your immune response against self antigens, uh, they're basically four types. I think the fourth one's cut out here, um, but that's not really important. The most important one are your type one and your type two. So your type one are your immediate hypersensitivity. So your acute phase hypersensitive responses. So for things like asthma attacks are the ones which um, are mostly involved in type one um, hypersensitivity. Um, and then your type two is your antibodies react against the normal antibodies present on your cell. And uh, these are things to do with, the, these are role in like rejection and organ transplants. Um, allergic, again, we talked about this. So you have your uh, sensitization, as we mentioned, because it is a foreign, as it is a foreign um, exposure, it would be detected. Uh, however, um, that really doesn't cause a huge response. You then have your secondary exposure down the line, and that's when you have your huge antibody response. Um, you also have your monoclonal antibodies. Uh, your monoclonal antibodies are your really specific antibodies which have a role to play in autoimmune disorders. And um, that's really important in certain new and upcoming medications, which I think you guys talked about in a biochem tute. Um, and those basically any medication that ends in MAB is a monoclonal antibody. So your rituximab is a common monoclonal antibody. Um, yeah, and it's also used in cancer therapy to really target uh, certain cancer cells. And the reason we need monoclonal antibodies is because you would not want a generalized immune response because cancer cells, after all, are cells of your own body, which kind of went haywire. So if you try to do that, you might end up causing a lot of systemic damage. And then your acquired immunity, just finishing up really quick here, you have your natural um, acquired immunity. Active immunity would be in the case of infection. A passive would be when it's passed down from mother to a child. And then you also have things like vaccines and um, indirect um, IgG or um, immunoglobulins injected into your body. So, so things like uh, a common example is snake venom, you have your antitoxin, so that's passive, artificial, and then your vaccines are active. Uh, we have a few questions here, which I'm really going to go through quickly. And these are in your lecture slides as well. So you can go through them and um, kind of um, understand better. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to con contact uh, Kavindu or me, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, which of the following is not a BAMP, so as we mentioned, protein uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns, and that's your toll like receptors because those are the ones found on your uh, innate immune cells, uh, which is the most abundant white blood cell, very common buzzword. Those are your neutrophils. Um, which of the following is directly, uh, so which of the following directly activates your pro IL1 beta to IL1, I, uh, sorry, IL1 beta? And these were your inflammatory mediators. And that's your capsaice. It was briefly mentioned, something like this is a bit more complex than what you'd expect to come on an exam. But the, the capsaice was basically what your uh, cell releases in the cytoplasm if it is infected. Which of the following directly, uh, yep. Which is not a fungal infection. Um, your Chagas disease, so that's, um, trypanosoma or your sleeping sickness, and the rest are fungal. Ringworm, it's not a worm, and this was something which I found really mind-blowing because I realized this in second year. Um, but your ringworm is basically a fungal infection which resembles a ring-like um, pattern on your skin, so that's why it's called a ringworm. Um, 
All of the following viruses except one are commonly present in a latent form. Um, hepatitis is the one which isn't. If it is, it's usually an indication of something gone wrong. Which of the following is not an immunological function of the lymphatic, lymphatic system? Um, so draining and filtering of extracellular fluid. This is, a, a, this is a feature of the lymphatics. However, it is not an immunological fu function, if that makes sense. Um, point mutations in influenza virus most commonly occur in um, so we talked about how viruses have uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, and the differences in them often cause uh, changes in the viral strains. And your hemagglutinin is the one where you most commonly see uh, mutations. Uh, which are the following um, parts of the fungal cell wall? Uh, your uh, ergosterol, because that is something which is not found in your body, would be the best target. Which parasite causes the most severe malaria infection? It's just something you need to remember. Um, Plasmodium falciparum, the way I remember it's, it's the longest two words, so it's the most severe infection. Um, all of these cause malaria, but this one's uh, especially quite dangerous. Uh, which of the following is not an example of innate immunity? Um, so you might have guessed that. High pH in stomach, that's a physiological barrier, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the innate immunity itself. Um, the role of complements in innate immunity are joining to form pores in the bacteria or binding. So this is basically your uh, cell lysis through your uh, inflammasome pathways, and this is your optimization. So the answer would be both um, A and B. Um, these question someone's asked. Uh, so do both complement pathways and effective function of the antibodies cause optimization, or is it that IgEs trigger complement pathways and then cause the complementary pathways to um, obstinate. Um, a great question, David. So what actually happens is that your antibodies do obstinize. Uh, however, your complement pathways also do the same thing through your C3B and C5B pathways. But these two aren't really related and are completely independent of each other. Um, you would have your IgGs causing the complementary pathway to also uh, have an elevated response. However, you'd still expect the complementary pathway to express those um, optimization factors, irrespective of whether they're being activated by your um, anti uh, antibodies or not. Um, okay, so just moving on, we're going to really rush to these questions. Um, so the answer would be both A and B. Which antibody can cause the placenta? We mentioned IgG being the neonatal immunity factor, so that's IgG. Um, an infection cut has become swollen and is leaking a white fluid. Which fluid? This fluid most likely consists of, as I mentioned, neutrophils, which uh, came in to kind of activate and um, deal with that in acute phase infection. Um, an infected cut has become, yep, here we go. Which now results in negative selection. Um, so we mentioned that you would not want a strong affinity because those can cause things like autoimmune disorders. So the answer would be strong affinity because you wouldn't want a hyper response. Um, in the, in the interest of time, I won't go through these questions. Uh, the answers are all in the uh, lecture notes itself. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact either me or Kavindu. Um, but yeah, that's most of what you would expect from uh, immunology and microbiology. Uh, these topics aren't particularly very, very high yield. Um, so you don't stress too much if you're kind of struggling with them. I know it's later in the semester and um, so these things are difficult to manage from time to time. But uh, what we've covered here is most of what you need to know for the purposes of exams. Um, thank you all for coming in. I know it's a Saturday morning and a lot of you might have better things to do. Um, but it's great to see you all here. And um, again, take care of yourself if you feel a bit low or need someone to talk to. We are always around. Um, and yeah, best luck for your exams. Hope you do well. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch.
Okay. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Connor, and I'll be doing the pharmacology revision lecture for today. Um, so, just in terms of uh, Quran. Oops. Uh, problem, I think. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. So, contents for today, we're just going to have a talk about some concepts um, and the NMJ, which you guys would be a bit familiar with already. I'm going to brush over anti cancer drugs because I know you'll be doing that in a subsequent lecture. And there's also some uh, other concepts in terms of pharmacokinetics and dynamics, as well as some antibiotics, antivirals, and antifungals. So if you have any questions, feel free to message me on Facebook um, and I'll post these slides up for you to access later. All right, so some fundamental concepts just to begin with. We've got drugs that can target a range of different um, components of the cells and processes. And just in terms of sensitivity, so you'll hear that term a lot. It really is just a concept that a drug will only bind to certain targets. Okay, a few other things before we go into the drug specifics. Um, drug binding interactions are really important and in terms of understanding how drugs act. So affinity is the ability of a drug to bind to the receptor site. Uh, efficacy is the ability of a drug to generate the response. And potency is the concentration at which the drug produces an effect. Okay, so just having a look at this diagram here, these are different types of drugs and how they work. So starting with antagonists, so these are drugs that bind to a receptor and inhibit a reaction. Um, and these are the opposite of agonists, which bring about a change in cell function after binding to a receptor. But then we do have things called partial agonists as well. And these have an affinity, but produce less of a response than their agonist component counterparts, sorry. And inverse agonists, which produce the opposite effect to an agonist. So competitive antagonism is when the drug occupies the site, but no stimulus is generated. Um, and these can be reversed by simply adding more of an agonist to displace the antagonist. So think of them as simply just setting, sitting in the receptors, blocking the NT from binding. And a non-competitive antagonist irreversibly binds to the receptor, or it can be allosterically bound. And this inhibits the agonist and reduces the overall magnitude of the maximal response. Okay, and here's just a diagram to uh, demonstrate how these two are different. Okay, a couple more definitions. So pharmacokinetics is really just what the body does, does to the drug, whereas pharmacodynamics is how the drug interacts with the body. So when looking at pharmacokinetics, we're looking at things like absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, whereas pharmacokinetics is looking at how the drug binds to the target site and what, create, what effect it creates. Okay, again, some more definitions. So first pass metabolism is talking about when the concentration of a drug is reduced during its metabolism by the liver before it even reaches circulation. Uh, bioavailability is a measure of how much of a drug is absorbed into circulation. And ion trapping is looking at how molecules are less able to cross membranes when they're charged. So weak electrolytes generally will accumulate in the area in which they are most ionized. So I'm going a bit quickly over these slides because these are things that you are probably already familiar with and can look at in your own time. So looking now at one of the core concepts is drugs and neurotransmission. And these are the drugs that I'd highly recommend you knowing. Um, some of them were tested last year in the exam. So atropine, uh, pyridostamine, uh, rocuronium, and succinamethonium. Uh, looking quickly at the nervous system. So we've obviously got the central nervous system composing of the brain and spinal cord. And the spinal cord really carries the bulk of what we're focusing on today. Of course, we also do have the peripheral nervous system as well. So looking at the NMJ, this is a really articulate diagram of how uh, neurotransmission works in the body and at the cell level. So firstly, we have initiation. So an action potential sorry, triggers calcium influx, um, which come through voltage-gated calcium channels, causing loaded uh, neurotransmitter vesicles to dock and exocytose. Uh, the neurotransmitters would then diffuse across the membrane into the synaptic cleft and towards the postsynaptic receptors. And then, of course, we have a postsynaptic effect whereby the neurotransmitters bind to receptors and cause muscle contraction. And deactivation is, of course, when neurotransmitters are deactivated by being broken down, or sometimes they can be taken up back into the original cell. So first, we have adrenergic nerves. So these are those that rely on the neuro neurotransmitters, noradrenaline, adrenaline, and dopamine. You should think of these 
in how they regulate the sympathetic nervous system, which is really just the fight or flight response. And there are two subtypes for this one. So we have alpha and beta, which I'm going to discuss in length in a minute. Um, this is really just looking at the preganglionic than the postganglionic. And we have acetylcholine for the first one, but you should associate these with the noradrenaline or adrenaline um, neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is just an intermediary. Okay, so this is just a table sort of summarizing where the receptors are and how they affect. So these are the effects of increasing the stimulation. Um, I'm not gonna go through these individually. I think you will come more into these when you look at the cardiovascular system in SEM2 and how you can target these with different drugs, etc. So cholinergic nerves, um, refer to those in the parasympathetic nervous system, as well as some, com some components of the somatic nervous system as well primary neurotransmitter is acetylcholine and there are two receptor subtypes as well so nicotinic and muscarinic again here are just some of the sort of layout of how these work as well okay so typically there will be questions that sort of ask what happens if you overstimulate or provide too much acetylcholine to specific receptors uh, there are a couple of acronyms you can use so you can use the sludge acronym to look at what happens in overstimulation of uh, muscarinic receptors, and then also looking at days of the week to remember nicotinic overstimulation. So similar to what we had in the adrenergic nervous innovation, we do have these in a variety of body systems and looking at how they can target those as well. To keep these in mind, think about rest and digest when it comes to parasympathetic system. Okay, so really importantly is the concept of removing neurotransmitters. So after a response is generated, neurotransmitters are inactivated by reuptake into the nerve. In instances where this is blocked, we typically have an overstimulation of the nerve. So this is done by substances such as cocaine. Um, there's also the important concept of a negative feedback inhibition, which means the transmitters release can be blocked during overabundance. However, we do have enzymatic breakdown with Mayer and COMT. This is sort of breaking down um, the autonomic nervous system, and it's something you will go into more detail in in semester two, but looking at how different drugs can target the different systems and what they have on each organ is important to know, particularly later. Okay, so looking at the drug specifics, there's quite a few, um, and I've sort of put the ones in bold that I'd like you to know. I have found a couple of ways of remembering them from last year, but it's up to you whether you would like to use them or not. So we have non-depolarizing blockers. So these are competitive antagonists at the nicotinic receptors that cause muscle relaxation, relaxation, sorry. And what these do is they block the receptors to prevent acetylcholine from binding. And then of course, stop other neurotransmitters from causing um, a reaction. So being a competitive antagonist, they can be overcome simply by increasing the concentration of acetylcholine. Um, but they do have side effects such as prolonged uh, paralysis, inadequate reversal of an NMJ blockade, rash, and pain on IV. So it's really important that these are given intravenously. They cannot be taken orally. So the one that you should know primarily is rocuronium. Uh, Tubacurarine is the one that the ancient Indians used to use, I believe. And we've sort of developed it to a more stable form in rocuronium. So you can think about rocuronium as acting like rocks and sitting in the way sitting in the receptor, getting in the way of another reaction from taking place. Okay, number two, we have succinamethonium. So these are depolarizing blockers and they actually stimulate nicotinic receptors to the point of hyperpolarization, which sort of breaks that cycle of polarization that we need for sustained contraction. So this causes paralysis. Um, this is a reliable and rapid onset of muscle relaxation and it's used in things like intubation. It is broken down by the enzyme cholinesterase that can elicit post-operative muscle pain, can cause arrhythmia, sorry, arrhythmia or bradycardia if you repeat dosages excessively. Okay, so an important thing with the NMJ is we need to have acetylcholine removed and it needs to be rapidly cleared by a cholinesterase. So there are two sort of main groups. The first one is acetylcholinesterase, which is the enzyme that you'll hear a lot about, um, and that breaks down acetylcholine but there are other non-specific ones that are made by the liver that I don't think you need to know. Uh, anticholinesterases are those substances that therefore block the function of the acetylcholinesterase. So these reversibly bind to the enzyme turn it off, which leads to a temporary excess of acetylcholine. Um, however, if we have instances where 
the colon estrays is, is irreversibly turned off permanently. This represents a huge medical emergency. And there are instances such as in nerve gases and some pesticides where this is the case. But we also have very stable, um, reversible ones that we use. So myasthenia gravis is a condition that you would have learned about now. Um, so this is a condition where NMJ transmission can only occur, um, sorry, only occurs with five to ten percent of total receptor activation. So basically, these people aren't as capable of having that um, transmission. And it's an autoimmune disease where the recept where the antibodies have attacked the nicotinic receptors, which has reduced the availability. Um, which means that action potential is only generated in a small number of fibers and that a contraction is not sustainable. So what happens is we have significantly increased muscle weakness after physical activity that requires rest to recover. Okay, so pyridostamine is the main drug that we will use here and it acts to increase the synapse concentration of acetylcholine by blocking that acetylcholinesterase. However, a side effect of this is that it does affect both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors, which is unwanted. Um, so what we do in the treatment for this is combine atropine to avoid that unnecessary um, stimulation of the muscarinic receptors. And we use corticosteroids as well to block the immune response. Okay, so just treating that poisoning, we do use atropine as I've just discussed. We use pro Prolidoxime, um, which is a cholinesterase reactivator for pesticides. In severe cases, we will need artificial ventilation. And so nerve gas poisoning is a very uh, severe case. We need to administer those drugs specifically. Okay, so this is the main one. If you hear my senior gravis in an exam question, this is the one you go for. It is an anticholinesterase. And as I said, it uh, slows the breakdown of acetylcholine. Um, and acts on both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors, which means it can lead to this overation, sorry, overactivation of the muscarinic sludge symptoms. So we use atropine to counter that. That's a competitive antagonist um, that prevents the binding of antis to muscarinic receptors. And of course, we can have the opposite effects of this. So we can have um, in the side effects, we have the opposite of sludge, so decreased sweating, flushing, confusion, and tachycardia. Okay, anti-toxic, I'm sorry, anti-cancer. I'm just really gonna brush over these quickly because you do have another lecture as already said, um, but there are notes here if you'd like them. So firstly, we have the cytotoxic agents which target protein produc production that are essential for cancer cells to grow. Um, there are many different types here, which we're gonna discuss quickly. So alkylating agents that interfere with cell replication. We have cytotoxic antibiotics um, that inhibit transcription and translation. We have anti-metabolites. Methotrexate is one that will come up in semester two as well. These are S phase specific, so remember them for that. Uh, we also have hormone agents particularly used in the treatment of breast cancer. These target estrogen, um, plant alkaloids. I don't think you need to know much about these. And of course, as you'll be familiar with, um, side effects from cytotoxic therapies are typically that they target high division rates um, in cell populations. So think of things like hair follicles, bone marrow, and epithelium. Um, these can reduce immunity and cause anemia, et cetera. There are also a bunch of gastrointestinal uh, side effects like nausea and vomiting, as well as organ toxicity that can precipitate irregular cardiac rhythms, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these are the new emerging um, and developing treatments that faculty are obviously really excited about. Um, we have monoclonal antibodies. Just remember these by their suffix, so MAB at the end. This is a breast cancer specific one, but I'm sure there are other ones. Um, interferons and interleukins are immunomodulating agents that modify the biological response. And of course there are side effects as well. These are always very expensive, keep in mind. And of course we have things like mutations that can develop resistance and cancer cells can actually adapt to avoid drug intake mechanisms. Again, these are the side effects. I'm just brushing over these because you will have another specific lecture for them. Of course, with the treatment of any cancer, you will uh, administer analgesics and antidepressants if needed, as well as focusing on the well-being of the patient. So managing vitals with dietary and lifestyle advice when necessary. Okay, and venoming. I think last year we had an active learning session on this. It was just one. It's quite simple. You will already be familiar that venoms are just biological processes that are injected or uh, bitten into a person. So poisons are a chemical substance that disturb an organism by a chemical reaction. 
I think last year we discussed snake bites, so this is what I've included here. You will have symptoms like partial ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, uh, dysarthria. Um, you can lose facial expression and have muscle weakness and pain. Venom, there are a bunch, so I'll collect, I'll collect this typo. Um, so you can have neurotoxins that affect the NMJ, myotoxins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, neurotoxins are an important group because they can be presynaptic and affect acetylcholine, or they can be postsynaptic and affect the receptors themselves. So presynaptic really just affect that process of recycling acetylcholine and deplete the neurotransmitter. However, slow, these are slow onset and can be reversed with anti-venom. Postsynaptic are more serious and bind competitively and irreversibly. So they only respond to an anti-venom if they're delivered early. Many venoms are also procoagulants and activate prothrombin to clot the blood. And anti-venoms are simply refined portions of IgG that bind to venom and neutralize their effects. Antibiotics, there are a bunch of these that you should be familiar with. Um, I'm just gonna talk about the mechanisms first. So chemotherapy, we're not talking in terms of cancer here, but we're just talking about the use of chemicals to treat or control a disease um, by infective agents. Anti-infective chemotherapy can be prophylactic. So this is when you administer medications to prevent an infection before it happens. So you'll see these used only for groups where there is a significant risk. So if you're traveling to regions where there's a high prevalence, um, we can use empirical chemotherapy. So that's where the causative agent isn't yet known. So we typically use a broad spectrum antibiotic to sort of target the most likely organism. And of course, after we've cultured the bacteria and we've determined what pathogen it is, we can use directed therapy. So to achieve selective toxicity, there are a bunch of mechanisms that we can target. Firstly, a common one is cell wall. So we can inhibit the enzymes that make the cross links that sort of compose the cell wall. Um, so also targeting the enzymes that make the peptidoglycan polymers, such as uh, vancomycin, and of course, we can target the mycobacterial cell walls themselves by using mycolic acids. Uh, folate, which is essential for DNA synthesis, we can target this. Um, so therefore targeting the synthesis of the genetic material and the virus, sorry, bacteria itself. So bacteria actually have to make their own molecule called PABA, and we can target the enzyme that makes this, that isn't present in humans otherwise. Protein synthesis, you'll be familiar with the process by now. So ribosomes are common. So we have many drugs that can activate on the, act on these and inhibit protein synthesis. Uh, we can in interfere with the movement of the ribosome along messenger RNA, which can cause misreading. And finally, we have nucleic acid synthesis, which will inhibit DNA or RNA synthesis. Okay, so this is sort of a diagram that really articulates where the drugs target the bacteria and how they can sort of kill the disease. Spectrum of activity is pretty self-explanatory. So we're just talking about drugs that can have a narrow or broad range. So broad range obviously target shared features, but they do have the widest range of adverse effects. Whereas drugs with narrow spectrum typically have reduced side effects um, and reduced side of resistance. Uh, types of antibacterial drugs, bactericidal drugs are those that actively kill the bacteria, whereas bacteriostatic drugs maintain the amount of bacteria in the system. So you might ask why we would use this. Well, it's if patients that are immunocompromised require this sort of drug because uh, bactericidal drugs have a tendency to release endotoxins after they kill the bacteria, which can be particularly harmful. Um, Minimum inhibitory concentration is a concept that just determines the lowest concentration that inhibits growth, whereas minimum bactericidal concentration is the lowest con concentration of a drug required to actively reduce the bacteria population. And this is just a diagram I pinched from one of the previous year's lectures. It sort of articulates all those concepts in one. Okay, so there are drugs that are time dependent. So for some antibacterial drugs, it doesn't matter what the concentration is. So you can increase the dosage as much as you want. It won't matter. You really just have to wait. Whereas others will respond to increases in concentration and effects are increased as concentration increases. Resistance is a huge problem that you will hear about a lot. So a lot of doctors are prescribing antibiotics where they don't need it. And of course, this is resulting in the emergence of resistant strains. So resistance can be intrinsic, so it means we're not targeting the correct uh, biological target, or it can be acquired. So 
bacteria can develop resistance if we place pressure on them that is not sufficient enough to kill them. Um, so it's really important to focus on dosage and ensuring patients complete a course of antibiotics or this can result in resistance. Therapeutic, wi therapeutic window refers to the plasma concentration range in which your drug's effective. And you're gonna choose an antibiotic based on a bunch of things like bacterial factors, host factors, and drug factors. All right, specific drugs themselves. Amoxicillin is essential. Um, it's a cell wall synthesis inhibitor and a beta-lactam. So it inhibits transpeptidase enzyme irreversibly and stops polymer cross-linking. This is a first-line drug you will, you will be familiar with, um, used for gram-positive bacteria, but it's not effective for cells without a peptidoglycan cell wall, obviously. So some people are really allergic to amoxicillin. So it's important we have an alternative and that is cephalexin. So it also targets cell wall synthesis and is a cephalosporin. Um, it inhibits transpeptidase irreversibly as well as stops the polymer cross-linking. So it's a very similar mechanism of action, action to amoxicillin. Um, it is a moderate spectrum drug and we typically only use it for penicillin sensitive patients. Um, Moving on, we have Omentin, which is, isn't a core drug, I don't believe, but you should be familiar with it. It's penicillin and clavulanic acid. So there are actually some bacteria that can produce beta-lactamase, which breaks down the beta-lactam ring and sort of stops amoxicillin from working. Um, but clavulanic acid acts on that enzyme and prevents resistance. But there are side effects like GIT, nausea, diarrhea, and people are allergic, of course. Okay, so vancomycin, is a cell wall synthesis inhibitor. It is transglycosidase um, and inhibits that stopping polymerization of the peptidoglycan chain. Typically, we only see this used in severe infections like multi-resistant Staph A, um, only used for gram positives and has a really interesting side effect of red man syndrome. Um, it can be nephrotoxic and ototoxic as well. All right, gentamicin is a protein synthesis inhibitor. It targets the 30S ribosomal subunit. So it binds irreversibly and causes that misreading of messenger RNA, but it's only used against gram, negative, gram negatives. Um, it's nephrotoxic, ototoxic, and can actually increase the effect of blockers of the NMJ. So keep that in mind when prescribing. Um, doxycycline is very similar, but it binds reversibly and interferes with the binding of um, tRNA and mRNA. We see this used in a wide spectrum of clinical cases. So it can be used for things like acne, but as well as things like bronchitis and respiratory tract infections. Um, it can be given to penicillin sensitive patients and can interfere with bone formation. So this isn't a drug you would use for children or pregnant women. All right, erythromycin. Um, it's a 50S ribosomal subunit um, inhibitor. So it, it once again stops this protein synthesis it interferes with the movement of the ribosome along messenger RNA, um, and it can precipitate GIT symptoms like diarrhea and nausea and have liver and cardiotoxic side effects. This is a mnemonic, I guess, from last year. Um, just remember this one as targeting the bigger 50S uh, subunit. Chloramphenicol is similar in that it binds to the same subunit, the 51, and inhibits the transfer of the peptide from uh, tRNA but it can lead to bone marrow suppression and grade baby syndrome. So this is not a drug you would prescribe to infants. Ciprofloxacin is a nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor and it inhibits topoisomerase. Um, it targets gram negative infections of bones and joints, but can have side effects towards uh, cartilage and tendons, et cetera. Um, the phototoxic element is a way of remembering this. So where, yeah, I don't know if this mnemonic helps, but if it does go ahead, uh, metron metronidazole is a nucleic acid synthesis inhibitor that is taken up by gram-positive anaerobes. That's an important keyword. Um, it is metabolized into an unstable form that results in DNA breakdown, and it interacts with alcohol metabolism, nausea, and dry mouth. Sorry, that's they're the side effects. So be careful when taking alcohol with this one. Um, this is another way of remembering it. So yeah, interacting with alcohol, you can't drink on the metro and it leaves a metallic taste as well. All right, so drugs for tuberculosis, there are only two, I believe, yeah. Um, so these are RNA synthesis inhibitor first, so rifampicin, um, it inhibits RNA 
polymerase enzyme and suppresses RNA synthesis. You always use this in combination, typically with this one over here. Um, and it's hepatotoxic, can cause fever, and leaves um, an orange-red urine that isn't harmful, but it is a good way of remembering it. So remember, rifampicin is red. Um, oh, I can't even say this. Isoniazid, um, it's a mycolic acid synthesis in inhibitor, um, and inhibits the synthesis of mycolic acids, of which TB is one. Um, it's used in combination with rifampicin and can lead to allergic skin reactions and be hepatotoxic. Antivirals, there are a few of these. Um, so viruses, obviously, as you know, replicate intracellularly. Um, drugs target viral-specific proteins to which they belong a specific, specific family of viruses. Um, drugs that are available are currently virostatic, which means that the host immunocompetence is important. Um, obviously, this represents the difficult and the immunocompromised. So most viruses are, however, self-limiting and overcome by the host. So we only use them in high-risk groups. So yeah, pregnant people, um, neonates and the elderly, as well as the immunocompromised. There are a few types. Um, we've got the DNA viruses. We've things like uh, adenoviridae, herpes viridae. And of course, we can move on to the retroviruses, things like HIV and hepatitis. For So hepatitis is a hepatinovirus. And we have the RNA only viruses, which are to the right there. Viruses obviously have the same problems with bacteria. There are the opportunities for resistance. So drug resistant genotypes can become dominant strains. Um, and that's because viruses mutate at extremely high frequencies. Um, and in many cases, there will be a requirement to administer combination therapy. And so that's particularly seen in HIV. Antiviral treatments, here's just a table sort of summarizing that. Um, we're going to go into them specifically now. Um, mechanism of action, of course, here's the sort of viral replication pathway, as well as a list of how the drugs target those. Um, there are just, this is sort of just to illustrate that there are a bunch of processes that drugs can target. Um, and I've listed them on the left here. So nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, you have the non-nucleotide version, proteotase, Protease inhibitors, entry inhibitors, and integrase inhibitors. Firstly, so treatments for herpes and shingles. We have this one on the left, acyclovir targeting nucleic acid synthesis. And what this does is that it actually becomes a substrate for viral DNA polymerase, and that prevents further elongation. It does require this kinase here. Um, and a good way of remembering it is lucky clover. Uh, you're lucky enough not to get shingles or herpes. Um, we do have Foscarnet, which is a non-nucleoside analog, and that inhibits viral DNA directly and doesn't require activation. It is used for herpes as well as cytomegalovirus, um, but it can be nephrotoxic and has been found to cause seizures. Influenza. Okay, so these drugs are assembly release inhibitors and a viral uncoding inhibitor. So uh, Oseltamivir inhibits neuraminidase and is virostatic, whereas amantadine blocks M2 ion channels on the surface of viral uh, particles. So this prevents influxes of hydrogen ions, which would lower acidity. And what this does is it, it stops this acidity, which prevents uncoating or release. Amantadine does have a bunch of side effects that are common, like GIT and Livido reticularis. I'll let you Google that one if you're interested. Um, we do have a drug for hepatitis B and C. So this is a viral messenger RNA translation inhibitor. It's interferon alpha and it's a biologic method. Um, it's simply a cytokine that stimulates immune responses and inhibits viral RNA. Okay, so treatment of HIV, the drugs that are used are called antiretrovirals and they target the point of entry, nucleic acid synthesis and late protein synthesis and processing. Um, when starting this treatment, we look at things like CD4 count and viral load, and there are many HIV approved drugs um, that are often used in combination. Really, we don't have a cure for HIV at the moment, but these drugs are looking at achieving a maximal suppression of the viral load, as well as restoring immune symptoms and improving the quality of life. Uh, this is a really blurry diagram of those processes again, apologies. Okay, so firstly, HIV drugs, we have 
uh, zidovudine, which is a nucleotide, and the non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor is nevirapin. So zidovudine is um, actually becomes a substrate that prevents elongation and requires activation by that kinase. Again, it is typically the first line drug and it prevents vertical transmission. And while nevirapine also prevents vertical transmission, it has a different mechanism action in that it directly binds and denatures that transcriptase. Uh, side effects listed down below. So zidovudine has low selective toxicity and nevirapine can elicit serious side effects with drug interactions with that important CYP450 liver enzyme. Um, targeting the protease um, component over here is rutonavir, which binds to viral protease and boosts other protease inhibitors. Again, the same hepatotoxic um, side effects. I don't know how this helps, but it was last year. Um, don't have much protein. Think of this as focusing on viral proteases, etc. Antifungals, and there's also an antiparasitic drug in here as well. So fluconazole is the first line antifungal and it targets cell membrane synthesis um, and inhibits that demethylase, which is involved in ergosterol synthesis. So this can be applied broadly and topically as well as orally. Again, the same hepatotoxic interactions with that enzyme. Uh, Amphotericin is the choice of drug for candida and aspergillus and upper GIT infections. So it binds irreversibly to ergosterol and disrupts that membrane but it can leave a host of common side effects. Um, there's a little mnemonic down the bottom to help you as well. Amphotericin stuck with A, so does aspergillus, I guess. Um, the antiparasitic is ivermectin. So this is a glutamate gated chloride channel targeter and it causes hyperpolarization, uh, paralysis and parasitic death. That was paralysis of the energy, not the whole person, sorry. Can be neurotoxic though, and typically when the parasites die, they can release that inflammatory response, but that can be managed as well. All right, um, practice questions I've got here, but I've got the answers directly after them. So I think what I'll do is I'll leave it here and I'll let you go through these yourself rather than, yeah, sort of just like ruin the answers for you. Um, if you have any questions, once again, feel free to message me on Facebook. These slides will be available. Um, yeah, I don't stress too much for the exams. Just work hard. Um, these are the least significant of your entire medical degree. So good luck, guys. Um, and I will catch you. Uh, that's the last all right, guys, uh, to kill, just going to close off the live stream now. Uh, the broadcast will still be up on YouTube, and all the slides will be on the Facebook page and Google Drive as well. So enjoy the rest of your Saturday and the rest of your weekend.